Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we take an up-close look at the most advanced telescope ever to launch into space, the James Webb Space Telescope. We welcome Scott Lambros, Instrument Systems Manager, for this remarkable instrument back to the show. But first, we're going to take a look at new evidence for volcanic eruptions on Mars in the surprisingly recent past. We also head out to the distant void of space as Voyager 1 detects a faint hum which could help us better understand interstellar space. Finally, we turn our sights to the James Webb Space Telescope as it unfurls its massive mirror for the final time on Earth before talking with our special guest who just returned from conducting the test. Now, volcanoes were once active on Mars, regularly bringing magma to the surface of the red planet three to four billion years ago. However, this geological activity largely died out, leaving researchers with little evidence for recent volcanic activity on our red neighbor. However, there's always a however. Data from the InSight Martian lander from NASA now reveals four Mars quakes occurring in two pairs of tremors roughly one Martian year or two Earth years apart. This activity suggests magma is still stirring under the surface of the red planet. This heat might potentially warm primitive life hiding beneath the ruddy surface, possibly affecting the search for life, past or present, on Mars. Uh, astronomers may get a better look at interstellar space thanks to a new study of data coming from the Voyager 1 spacecraft. A faint record of electromagnetic waves recorded during that vehicle's eight-year exploration of interstellar space could be used to study this unknown region, the Cornell study concluded. This technique could assist astronomers seeking to learn more about the regions of space just beyond our family of planets. The mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope was recently unfurled on Earth for the final time as NASA conducts their final tests on the instrument prior to launch. The six and a half meter wide mirror is segmented into 18 hexagonal segments, allowing the telescope to be packed into the Ariane 5 rocket, which will lift it into space. Webb will travel one million miles from Earth before beginning its study of the cosmos. Liftoff of this revolutionary spacecraft is currently scheduled for October 31st, Halloween. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Scott Lambros, Instrument Systems Manager for this revolutionary space telescope.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to welcome Scott Lambros back to the show. He is NASA's Instrument Systems Manager on the James Webb Space Telescope. Welcome back, Scott. Thank you for having me again. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Great. Always great talking with you. So just tell us, uh, for those who may not know too much about it yet, uh, what is the James Webb Space Telescope and what do you hope to accomplish? Okay, it's a, it's a six and a half meter diameter segmented telescope. Segmented means it's made up of 18 separate mirrors that are hexagonal segments that all come together as one mirror. And it's 18 mirrors because um, it's segmented because it has to fit in the rocket and it's too big to fit in the rocket as it is. So the three wings on each side fold back um, and then they get deployed once it gets up on orbit. So it's the largest space telescope mirror that will be launched in this October. Um, and it's gonna do some great things, um, which I can tell you if you wanna, want me to go into that. Oh, yep, just keep going. Yeah. Okay, so there's so science wise, there's basically four science themes. One is um, first light. So we hope to see 13 and a half billion light years away. So you're looking at 13 and a half billion light years in the past, which is when the first stars and galaxies were formed after the Big Bang, uh, a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang. Um, the next science theme is star formation and protoplanetary disks. You know, how stars are formed along with the planets around them. And then galaxy formation, how galaxies come together and all the physics involved there. And then exoplanets, which is a big hot topic these days. Um, so we'll be looking at exoplanets and many different areas. Um, we hope to see some very young planets uh, to help figure out how they're formed and uh, like that. And, and because we can see so far away, we'll see, um, that's how we can see young planets and young objects to investigate all this stuff. That's pretty amazing. So we've confirmed, you know, roughly 4,400 exoplanets so far. Have right. there been any studies or estimates done on how many planets that Webb might be able to find? Um, I don't know how many, but what I can tell you is um, we've recently selected uh, proposals for um, for the first year of operations. So, um, so let me talk about that a little bit. So um, these are proposals that uh, anybody can propose to. Um, they're called guest observer programs. And um, in April, we just made the selection. There's... Um, about 270 proposals selected, I guess it's 6,000 hours of observing time. And those proposals are, are uh, kind of binned in all the different science areas which support those four major themes. But within those themes, there's um, all kinds of things that, you know, covers the whole gamut of cosmology and astrophysics. And one of them is exoplanets. And there's there was something like 70 proposals um, just in exoplanets themselves. Um, so, so one of them is looking for lava on an exoplanet. One's looking at Alpha Centauri, our nearest neighbor. What kind of planets are there? Um, the, the instruments are well suited for this because they, they can do spectroscopy of the, of the atmospheres. Um, there's a lot of coronography on them with um, pretty sophisticated masks that mask the light of the star that the planet is going around. And so you can you can actually see you can actually image some of the larger planets or um, you know or anyway yeah or do the spectroscopy and find out what what elements they're made of so so it's a big topic and so as I said that's basically for the first year um, there are also um, what we call GTO proposals which is guaranteed time observers observations and those are for the people the scientists that have been working on this project project for up to the last 20 years. And uh, 
So this is their payoff now. They get, um, there's about 4,000 hours allocated for those people. These are people that work on the instruments or on the science team, the science team which oversees the development of the observatory from the science perspective. They've been around a long time, they put their time in, so now they get to propose what they wanted to do as well. So there's more exoplanet proposals there as well, um, as well as, again, it covers the whole gamut. Um, just for some examples, one of them, one of them wants to look at uh, dark matter um, to determine whether it's cold, if dark matter is cold or if it's not cold. Um, they're looking at uh, black holes, jets coming out of black holes, what's the physics involved there? Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of galaxy formation uh, proposals, um, very, really cool stuff, interesting stuff. And then a lot of solar system uh, proposals as well, like the climate on Pluto, um, Neptune and Uranus, what, you know, what's happening there, and as well as Kuiper Belt objects, comets coming from other solar systems that pass through ours. Um, is there water on asteroids? Things like that. So it's, it's runs the gamut. Um, it's all very exciting, actually. It's pretty, it's really amazing. I'm really looking forward to seeing all the science. Not to mention the pretty pictures that this thing will produce. Yes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, to the deep fields as well. Yes. Um, yeah. Just a, a point about that, you know, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is the one where they sat for 17 days looking at the same spot where we thought there was nothing. Mm -hmm. and thousands of galaxies. Um, that 16 days, JWST can do in seven hours. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's going to be amazing what we can see when we stare for, for a much longer time. Wow. Well, that's amazing. So you just bring this up. How would, I mean, when people think space telescope, you know, of course, the first thing that comes to mind for most people is going to be the amazing record, 30-year record of, of Hubble. How does Webb compare to Hubble? Okay, so... Um... So the JWST is in the near infrared. Hubble is in the visible range for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is we'll be able to discern objects that are further away because they're more red shifted. Um, so the further away they are with the expansion of the universe and the, how things are moving away from us and how long it has to travel to get here, the uh, wavelengths are stretched into the infrared. So we'll be able to see that. Also, the Hubble telescope is two and a half, two point four meters, and ours is six and a half meters. So um, we have a lot more collecting area. Um, we're about a hundred times more sensitive when you factor in the, you know, the uh, quality of the detectors and and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah. And you just came back from a week of what looks to have been some pretty successful testing. How'd those tests go? Oh, the tests are going really well. Um, yeah, so the test that I was just out there for was the, the last uh, deployment and stowing of one of the wings. So the wings are the, as I said, the three mirrors on each side that fold back. So it was stowed and now it was deployed. Um, basically, what we're doing is um, last August and September, we did uh, our environmental tests, our vibration and acoustic tests. So since then, we've been doing deployments um, post-environmental tests to prove that everything still works. Um, and it's been going very successfully, actually. Um, we, the biggest one, of course, was the sun shield that takes several weeks to do, um, and, it, and it was successful couple of minor things, but overall, um, nothing that would have stopped it from deploying on orbit. So that was a big milestone. And like I said, the one we just did, the, the one of the wings uh, deployed and then we stowed it again. So it is now stowed and will not deploy again until it gets on orbit. The other wing now um, was deployed this week. So it's deployed, it's out there now deployed um, and it will be stowed in a few days do a few more tests on it and, and then it'll go back and then it'll be ready so the mirrors then will be done uh, testing of the instruments are 
all done except for one one more test we have where we're going to go put everything in a safe mode so we have one of the instruments on safe mode is if something goes wrong um you know it saves everything so we can figure out what happened and then we bring everybody back up again wow. so one of the instruments is involved in that and um but aside but all the others are are done until we get to the launch site so we get to the launch site we'll do one more comprehensive test uh, with the instruments and the spacecraft before we launch so we also you must be as a uh, instrument uh, instrument systems manager you must be pretty proud of some of the instruments on board that craft can you just give us a brief rundown of some of the instruments we will be carrying oh sure um so so there's uh there's essentially four instruments one is near cam air infrared camera um and it's it mainly does imaging although it does do some spectroscopy as well um and that's the principal investigators from university of arizona lockheed martin is the um, prime contractor on that uh there's another one called miri mid instrument mid ir instrument that one is um the optic system is from uh europe it's a consortium of countries in europe uh underwritten basically by esa the european space agency mm -hmm. and uh, jpl provides the the software for that and the focal plane the focal plane array as well and um then there's near spec near infrared spectrum spectrograph so as the name implies it does spectrum uh, uh as opposed to imaging for the most part and um it's built um by esa basically with a prime contractor is airbus in germany and then uh there's the um fine guidance sensor and the nearest instrument so this comes from canada the fine guidance sensor is uh more or less part of the attitude control system so it its job is to take pictures very very detailed pictures um 8 by 8 pixels which is very small pixels 70 milli arc seconds of a of a known star and so we send those pictures to the attitude control system so they know where the observatory is pointing and then you can know where the instruments want to point and you you know they can point very accurately that way on the other side of the optical bench on that instrument is this, is an instrument called nearest near ir um near uh, ir nearest nearest anyway, it's a nearest is good nearest the dearest oh they're going to kill me for forgetting this now. <laughs> it's not you'll be on time. the blooper reels of your careers <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's a it's the spectrum of, <laughs> of things it's going to be good for looking at uh, atmospheres of protoplanets or exoplanets mm -hmm. um so uh that's also from canada and this whole science team associated with that's them that's great well. that's fabulous <laughs> all right and uh we do have a listener a viewer question from youtube uh, Esteban would like to know where is the James Webb Space Telescope now, and will the public have any chance to see it before liftoff? Uh, it, it is now at Northrop Grumman, the prime contractor in Redondo Beach, California. Um, I believe, actually, <laughs> there was a media day earlier this week, mm, um, yeah. and two of the interviews with our project manager and the Northrop project manager were done in front of the window that overlooks the telescope that's probably as close as you're going to be able to see um especially with covid and everything right um, but obviously you know, the launch will be on NASA TV and yes accessible yes. to everyone yeah. yeah yeah so we we we'll start wrapping it up and then we ship it out at the end of August um to go to the launch site for a launch in October end of October great well thanks again it was great having you on the show Scott and congratulations to you and everyone at NASA for a mission so far so good yeah so far so good 
This is um, it's actually quite thrilling now to be this close to launch, and we're for all the great things we think are going to come out of this. So, thanks for having me again. I'm I'm happy to share what we what we know. That's great. Welcome back anytime. Okay. All right. So that was Scott Lambros, the NASA's Instrument Systems Manager for the amazing upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. Make sure to join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we take a look at a project that could soon become the first mission far into the void between the stars, the Interstellar Probe. We'll talk with Dr. Elena Provornikova from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory about this futuristic mission. Make sure to join us then. While we're on the subject, join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news and mix it together with interviews from groundbreaking scientists and distribute it directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before the general public. Lucky them. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. And as always, Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or any major podcast provider. You know how social media works. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit the, the cosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.